Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Flattner, the editor of the Journal of Democracy. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's talk by Ivan Krashtev. Uh, as our invitation for this event uh, indicated, we've titled the session, The Spectre Haunting Europe, which is the headline given to a set of articles that will be appearing in the forthcoming October issue of the Journal of Democracy. The phrase comes, of course, from the opening sentence of the Communist Manifesto. But when Mark, Marx wrote these words in 1848, he made it clear what specter he was talking about, the specter of communism. But the specter haunting Europe today is not so easily named. Observers and analysts speak of populism, nationalism, nativism, illiberalism, xenophobia, um, and these political tendencies are found both on the right and on the left. They're typically anti-establishment, anti-immigrant, anti-globalization, anti-EU, anti-American, and sometimes openly anti-democratic. Now these forces are not really new in Europe, but their influence has been growing rapidly in recent years. And the urgency of the challenge they present has been underlined both by the election in late 2015 of an illiberal government in Poland and by the June 2016 British vote in favor of leaving the European Union. Our extensive coverage of the advanced democracies of Europe in this issue represents a departure for the Journal of Democracy, which is always concentrated primarily on the challenges facing new and aspiring democracies in the developing and post-communist world. This policy of ours reflects the feeling, which was widespread among both scholars and practitioners, that the long-established or advanced democracies were thoroughly consolidated and hence could be regarded as safely in the democratic camp. But today, that feeling of security about the future of the advanced democracies no longer seems justified. An additional reason for worrying about the health of the advanced democracies was provided by an article by Robert Foa and Yasha Monk that was published in the July 2016 issue of the journal. That essay warned precisely of the danger of deconsolidation, presenting survey data that suggest a weakening of public support for democracy, especially among the young in both Europe and the United States. And recent developments across Western Europe, <coughs> across the Western democracies, suggest that these shifts in public opinion already are having concrete effects that show up on our television screen. The articles in the forthcoming October issue are devoted only to continental Europe, but we plan to address the British case in January and the situation in the United States in April. The set of articles appearing in the October issue includes an effort to distinguish and to categorize the new parties and movements on the continent. Also a look at the weakness of the traditional left, in addition, an exploration of why Eastern Europe is especially vulnerable to the current uh, drift. And finally, separate current country essays on Germany, France, and Poland. But concluding this, the entire section is a wonderful essay by our speaker today, Ivan Krashta. Entitled, The Unraveling of the Post-1989 Order, it contends that we have all misunderstood the nature of the post-Cold War era that we have been living through over the past quarter century. We will make copies of Ivan's article, along with the editor's introduction and the cover of the October issue. We will make them available for you as you leave this session. Now, in my view, Ivan Krashtev is simply the most interesting and provocative analyst of the state of democracy in the world today. While one may not always find his arguments entirely convincing, there's no doubting their originality or the verve and incisiveness with which they're presented. And although Ivan has been much less well known in the United States than in Europe, I suspect that may begin to change 
and now that he's recently become a contributing writer for the New York Times. Yvonne's day job, or he has several day jobs, is the ch uh, one is chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in his native Bulgaria. He's also a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna and a founding board member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. His most recent books in English are Democracy Disrupted, The Global Politics of Protest, and In Mistrust We Trust, Can Democracy Survive When We Don't Trust Our Leaders? Ivan is also a member of the Journal of Democracy's editorial board and a regular contributor to our pages. So I have many, many reasons to be pleased to have the opportunity to introduce him here today. Those of you who are on Twitter can follow this presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NEDEvents or by following the forum at Think Democracy or the endowment at NE Democracy. Please take a moment now to join me in silencing your cell phones, and I'm pleased to give the floor to Yvonne. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, for somebody who does not have English as his first language, being published in the Journal of Democracy is an incredible privilege. Because there you can be wrong, but you cannot look stupid, <laughs> which makes it so well edited that basically, nevertheless, <laughs> Uh, your argument, uh, it's going basically, it sounds very nice. Listen, what I'm planning to do is the following. Uh, just in 20 minutes, I'll try to present you the major argument, uh, so in order basically to have a possibility to talk about it. Uh, as you know, in the science fiction literature, there is a moment in which the protagonist decides that the experiment has gone wrong, and he wants to go back to the design table. In history, this option is not available, but I do believe that desire to do it again in a different way is very strong in different places. And one of the interesting uh, characteristics of the time that we're living through is that you can see the resentment towards the post-1989 world, basically in places like the United States and Europe, the two players that made this world, uh, which is very different, basically, the type of resentment that you can find in other parts of the world. I'm saying this because I do believe that we are witnessing not simply the crisis of democracy, we're not talking about backsliding of uh, Central and East European democracies and this type of language which very much talks about pathology, but we are basically in a moment in which we are going to be forced to redefine some of the major concepts with which we are working. This unraveling of the post-Cold War order, in my view, has three very different but very closely related dimensions. One is the West's lost loss of power, and this is kind of very visible. Uh, it can be seen basically in the insurgence of Russia. You can basically see it in the rise of China. You can basically also see it uh, in the proliferation of different conflicts, which basically are not maintained anymore. Uh, but this kind of a change on the level of uh, the redistribution of power uh, has also very strong in its effects on the very kind of attractiveness of the idea of uh, market democracy. We always assume uh, that market democracy is universally attractive. If you read public opinion polls, this is true. But the story is that there are a high percent of people in Russia who claim that they live in democracy and that they like what they see than in the United States. So from this point of view, democracy has become one of those kind of a very loosely defined concept in which everybody believes that democracy is what he or she uh, is claiming to be. And the third uh, dimension of this uh, unlocking, of course, is the crisis of the liberal democratic regimes themselves. And I'm going to argue that Europe, the place where this post-Cold War order in a certain way was very much shaped, where the end of the Cold War uh, was most visible, is now one of the places where this crisis, very much described as the rise of populism, uh, is most visible. I'm saying this because if you see the paradox of the EU crisis, and I'm not going to talk about this, there is one thing that probably is going to strike you. Most of the criticism and attacks on the European Union uh, on discourses 
of democracy. It's about the democratic deficit, the lack of democracy. Go to the British referendum, people are going to say that they want back control. So it's very much about democracy. And the second uh, language and the second discourse on which uh, this criticism is taking place is discourse of the return of the nation state, basically sovereignty discourse. The paradox is that if the process of disintegration of the European Union is going to continue, and if we are basically going to see partial or total disintegration of the Union, the paradox is that as a result of it, we can expect that some of the liberal democracies in the region are going to break down, and also some of the nation states are going to break down. And this was hinted basically even after the moment of the Brexit referendum, where you basically see the major crisis of the British political system, and where basically the talk about the next Scottish referendum uh, put the problem of the very survival of the United Kingdom in the way we know it uh, into question. I'm saying this and then as a result of it, basically, uh, I want to come back to Central and Eastern Europe and make the next step uh, in my argument. And the next step is the following. Now when people talk about the crisis of democracy, many try to reduce the problems which we face to the economic problems created to the financial crisis, uh, to the anti-globalization and others. And of course, this has part of its explanatory uh, uh, power member states for the last 10 years. In a certain way, Poles didn't get the financial crisis. Uh, economically, the country was doing well, the country was opening, and even the level of social inequality in Poland is relatively low. So you cannot basically explain everything that is happening. Uh, through the rise of social inequality. Uh, you have a government that have been elected, uh, and this government is not a new party that nobody knows where it comes from, so it's not a classical protest vote. It is a party that was in power before, and it was, going, was voted out, exactly because if people didn't like very much its performance till 2007. So why then? we have this strange paradox. In Poland, according to the opinion poll, this is the most pro-EU positive public opinion. More than 70% of the polls declare that they have a positive view on the EU. And then they're voting for a party which is openly Eurosceptical to the extent that a week ago, the Polish government decided to remove European flags from the public buildings. Secondly, you have a society which, according to the public opinion polls, is highly mistrustful to its politician, nothing new there. Uh, but the problem is why then they're ready to consolidate and to give power to one person, to one party, to the government, and basically dismantle the system of check and balances presented by the Constitutional Court. Why mistrustful people are ready to give the power to somebody? And thirdly, uh, which is also kind of uh, Quite interesting why uh, this strange mentality, because Mr. Kaczynski, by the way, unlike some of the other populist leaders uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, he's not a corrupt opportunist. By the way, this is very rare to be said. Mr. Kaczynski is not corrupt. To the extent uh, that till several years ago, he didn't have a bank account. And he didn't have a bank account because he was afraid that somebody can put money on his bank account. I know people who are afraid that somebody is going to take money from the bank account, uh, but from this point of view, as you know, Mr. Kaczynski is very different. Uh, so he's very representative, politically speaking, for something. There was a new book being published by Mark Liu at these days, uh, talking about uh, this type of a classical reactionary mentality which is not conservative. I do believe he's very good making this very important distinction, saying that conservatives and liberals disagree about the human nature. They have a different assumptions what the human nature is. Revolutionaries and reactionaries disagree on something totally different about the historical breaks. Revolutionary believes that the new world is the one that we can hope for, uh, while basically the reactionaries believes that this is the old world that we should dream for. In the case of Poland, even this type of a nostalgia is something quite problematic because Mr. Uh, uh, Kaczynski basically is talking very much about Polish tradition, Poland in the pre-war period and others. But if you see Poland in the pre-war period was quite contested multicultural society, one third of the population being non-Polish, Germans, Jewish, Ukrainians. 
Now Poland has more than 95% ethnic homogeneity. So from this point of view, even this nostalgia is uh, quite interesting because this is nostalgia quite often to something that never existed. Why I'm saying that Poland is important for my argument? Because I do believe that in many other countries, you can come and start to believe that economic explanation is going to work, that basically protest vote is going to explain. Here, obviously, we're seeing something much more uh, profound and interesting. And this is why I do believe that the real question is not what we did wrong, by the way, probably. We did many things wrong, and probably we're going to continue doing it. The problem is what we got wrong. Is there something about the nature of the post-communist period that we didn't manage to capture on time, and basically now it comes back to us? And doing this, I decided to reread some of the founding uh, texts which came at the end of the Cold War. And of course, the most important from this point of view was Fukuyama's The End of History article. Uh, I mean the article, not the book, because, uh, and it was important because nevertheless, that people like to criticize and the ridicule. Uh, the truth is that it captured some very important moment in 1989, and it was exactly the moment where people believed that some world has disappeared and something totally new is coming. By the way, don't forget, it was 1989. If you read carefully Fukuyama, he was not betting that Soviet Union is going to disappear. Uh, he was betting on something totally different. He was betting to the fact that because there is no any universal challenge and alternative to liberal democracy, that the world in which we're going to live in is going to be the world of imitation. Others are going to imitate the West. Some are going to do more successfully, others less successfully. Innovation is going to move from politics to economy. This was the time when internet, basically, uh, boom was starting and you have totally new economy. But when it comes to politics, it's going to be about imitation. Uh, and because you're going to have an imitation, the people are going and countries are going to imitate the West uh, because this is what it works. I do believe it's quite important assumption because uh, uh, Mr. Fukuyama believed and he's somebody who stayed on the editorial board, so I know Mark knows more about it. And it's not by accident, by the way, that this is a Japanese-American that can believe that first the copy can be better than the original. <laughs> uh, but secondly, that imitation in general does not need to provoke resentment. Uh, I don't believe people are trying to trivialize what Fukuyama was claiming then and now. He never believed that it's going to be a period without conflicts. He never believed that they're going to be kind of a total dominance of the West. But he said, listen, at the end of the day, they're going to be the original, and they're going to be the imitations. Almost at the same period, another American scholar, sitting in Berkeley and not in Washington, Ken Jowitt uh, wrote a book, a uh, series of essays called The New World Disorder. Jowitt totally agreed with Fukuyama that the end of the Cold War was epochal change. But the difference between two of them was that Jowitt was not a Japanese. He was an American Irish Catholic married for a Jewish, with Jewish wife who went to live one year in Ceausescu's Romania. And he was very much interested how the communist models had been implemented on the periphery of the communist system. What he learned there was that imitation always provokes resentment. First, imitation is taking different forms, many of them being pure faking. People basically, he said, are playing golf, not because they like the game in some of these countries, but because they try to look like an Americans, because if you look like an Americans, you suppose that Americans are going to defend you. Uh, uh, but as a result of it, uh, these fakes uh, are starting to have a life of their own. And then basically, uh, the West is facing the following problem. Either to recognize the fakes and saying, listen, it also works, or to start to lecture them and to license who is democracy and who is not democracy. And this also produces resentment. I'm saying this because till now, and the journal is also a representative for this. For 25 years, we have been asking the question how the West succeeds or fails to transform the other part of the world. I do believe now we're facing a different question, how the other part of the world is succeeding to change the West. <laughs>
and part of these populist movements, which you can see, are very much related to some of these problems that uh, I'm going uh, to talk. To what extent, uh, what we expected to be a period in which, for example, in Europe, borders are going to lose some of their meaning, uh, things are going to disappear, in fact, is replaced by a period in which we see a very intensive period of identity building, some of the political discourse and political ideas that look uh, that being buried forever back. I'm going to give the migration crisis as a very important uh, uh, example of this. Migration crisis is a important, the most important crisis that Europe is facing. This is the only pan-European crisis, by the way. Because out of the, for example, you have the Euro crisis, it's very important, but it stays in the Eurozone. And countries which are outside of the Eurozone, basically they're not ready to treat Eurozone crisis as their own. Then you have the Russia-Ukrainian crisis. Countries like the Baltics, <laughs> Poland, feel it very much, go to Spain and Italy, talk with them about uh, Russia or Ukraine. They don't know what you're talking about. The problem with the migration is, it really goes to every single political community in the European Union. And here I'm going to claim that in order to understand this crisis, we should understand that migration crisis has three totally different dimensions. One and the most obvious is that you have millions of people coming to the European Union as a result of the Syrian war, but also much more people coming from Afghanistan and other places. This is a challenge. This challenge was dealt in a different way in different countries. But the second dimension of the migration crisis is the migration of the voters of the center left and center right to the extremes. Just to give you one example, and uh, I know that uh, there was this article on what happens to the uh, moderate left in Europe. On the last, the second round of the presidential election in Austria, we're going, you know, we're going to have a third round. Uh, 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 so basically, 80% of the blue collar workers voted for the far right. And this major migration of the blue collar vote from the left to the far right is something that can be seen in Germany, in France. So this migration of voters is also very important understanding of the migration crisis. And if you see basically the policies of Chancellor Merkel and others, this is very much there. You also have a migration of arguments. In the 1970s, it was quite popular on the left to say that uh, development cannot be imposed on some, for example, tribes in India or Latin America. They have right to protect their way of life. Is it true also for the middle class communities, quite rich communities in Western Europe? Do they also have the right to protect their way of life? How does it work? So I'm saying all this because if you see uh, the, the migration crisis managed to produce a major split between Western Europe and Eastern Europe in the beginning of the crisis. Basically, Chancellor Merkel on one side and Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban on the other. Strangely enough, after 25 years, Western Europe and Eastern Europe reacted differently. And I'm going to give you four explanations about East European behavior before making, going to make my last and important argument, at least I do believe it's important. Listen, it's very easy to try and to say that simply what East Europeans was scandalous, but it is only understanding this reaction we're going to understand what is changing very much in European politics and the type of crisis we talk about. In order to understand incredibly high hostility of East European societies and not only populist leaders to migration, we're talking about a level of consensus that does not exist on any other issues. And we're talking about the countries in which de facto there are no migrants. In Slovakia in 2015, there were 169 migrants. Out of them, eight decided to stay. So we're talking about something, there are people going through the region, but basically they don't stay for, for different reasons. Uh, so why this painful, so powerful, and so consensual reaction in such different countries, where it comes from? I'm going to give you just four arguments because they're leading me where I want to go. The first is demography. Demography is one of the highly under-conceptualized and under-studied source in democratic politics. And it's not only East European. I do believe that if you see to the support of Mr. Trump, you're going to see a lot of demographic fears. Basically, you have a majority groups that starts to believe 
that they're losing, that time is against them, that they're going to end up as minorities, so you have the threatened majorities as the major political actor. In small countries of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, this type of a demographic fear is becoming even a fear of ethnical disappearance. Our ambassador is here and he knows it better than me. Bulgaria, according to the UN projections in the next 30 years, is going to lose 27% of its population. We're talking of a country of 8 million. For the last 25 years, almost 10% of the Bulgarians have left working or living abroad. As a result of it, basically the migration crisis created a kind of a fear of disappearance. You start to fear that in the next 100 years there are not going to be Bulgarians around at all. And this is changing the idea of your own idea of your own mortality. Can you imagine what it is that you're doing something and probably you dream to remain in the textbook of your own country and nation, and then you're going to understand that in 100 years probably they're not going to be a textbook in Bulgaria. So there is no way to remain. I'm saying this because this type of a demographic aspect is extremely important for small nations, and this can be seen uh, part of this high level of intolerance which was demonstrated. Uh, because normally, when you talk about migration, people are telling how much is changing the life of the people traveling, for example, from Aleppo uh, to Germany. But also you should try to imagine that also the life is changing very much for some of this old lady living in Germany, in Germany who never uh, changed the place in which they're living, but their neighborhood totally changed. And this kind of a strong desire to live in a place where you have been born, I mean culturally, is very strong also among the old voters and explains part of the intensity of what we're seeing. The second story is that unlike Western Europe, Eastern Europe has a totally different understanding of the cosmopolitanism and basically internationalism that came after 1989. Uh, Mr. Kaczynski never changed his views from 1989. From this point of view, he very much reminds people like Mr. Sanders or Mr. Corbyn, basically people who stayed on the same position over a very long period of time. Simply in 1989, the Polish revolution has two faces. There was internationalist, kind of a cosmopolitan face of people like Michnik in Czech Republic, uh, uh, President Havel and others, but there was also quite strong traditionalist, nationalist, Catholic face, which people like Mr. Kaczynski presents. These people were very happy of their country joining European Union and NATO because this means to get out of the Russia sphere of influence, but at the same time, they were always highly suspicious towards internationalism, because for them, European internationalism was just a version of the Soviet internationalism that they had been fighting. So paradoxically, in Western Europe, the end of the World War II meant the moral delegitimation of the nation state as one of the reasons for the war. In Eastern Europe, it was very much the delegitimation also of internationalism because communist regime was perceived as internationalist. Uh, I'm saying all this because as a result of it, you can see the society is being totally split between much more kind of urban, cosmopolitan-minded uh, capital cities uh, and part of the countryside. And this is uh, uh, one of the major splits that we see. And if you remember, I was asking you a question, how are you going to explain that mistrustful people are dismantling the check and balances, they get against the independent court, uh, even independent media, they have nothing against government basically taking control of the public television. Paradoxically, for many of these people who voted for these parties, the separation of power is simply a mechanism for the elites to get out of responsibility. You go to the government and the government said, listen, I cannot do nothing because the court is not allowing me. Uh, and then you go basically to here and there. So paradoxically, this type of a new, much more powerful, quite authoritarian-minded leaders came to power, not because people don't care about accountability, but they do believe that in order to keep somebody accountable, you should give him all the power. And this phen phenomenon can be very seen also in places like Turkey. I want to be sure that you have all the power so I can keep you responsible for everything that happens because then my ballot matters. Otherwise, my ballot doesn't matter because the power is so diffused that I cannot do anything about it. 
I'm, I'm finishing saying the following. If this is true, and if basically uh, we see such a dramatic change, and we clearly understand that part of the success of consolidation of liberal democracies in Central and Eastern Europe, first, was very much dependent on the international context. But secondly, it was also very much dependent on the existence of a very particular type of a voter who make this system work. And I'm going to call this voter a post-communist voter. These were people, many of them members of the Communist Party, which after the change, on one level feel ashamed uh, of the role that they have been playing, but secondly, they have a fear, so even when they have been a majority, they have been trying to behave as a minority because basically they didn't feel basically being the majoritarian force. This explained why the shifts and rotation of power was taking so easily and why basically in Europe for a very long period of time, I mean especially in the European Union, we have a change of governments without change of policies. This, by the way, was one of the formula in the EU. You have policy without politics on the Brussels level and politics without policy on the national level. On the national level, you can change governments, but you cannot change policies. This is now going to be very much uh, contested. It's going to be under question. And then I do believe, and this is my last uh, sentence, we have been asking question, and we have been assuming that liberal democracy is kind of a universal thing. Now we're starting to understand that the consolidation of liberal democracies, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, was very exceptional. It was based on certain type of preconditions which are not there anymore. Neither the international context, no basically this electoral body, very much based on the legacy of the, of the communist regime. So how liberal democracies are going to survive in the absence of these two conditions, I do believe is a question for the next discussion. And here our science fiction literature probably can give some help. Thank you very much. Thank you for a talk that I think fully vindicated my, uh, my praise of you uh, as an analyst. Um, before opening it to the floor generally, I just wanted to uh, raise one uh, point with you, which is uh, on the question of imitation, um, which you cite Fukuyama in connection with. But the European, I mean, the East Europeans themselves were constantly saying that they favored a return to Europe, Absolutely. going back, copying what that they had missed decades of history and so on. And so it was not uh, simply a uh, an imposition on them from the outside. No, no, totally. Listen, mm -hmm. uh, when I say imitation, it is a voluntary borrowing. Uh, uh, from this point of view, uh, we are not talking that somebody forced us to imitate. Imitation became our own ideology. Uh, it was, by the way, very much spelt on the idea of normality. Having a normal country, normal democracy, normal political system, this is how it worked. Uh, the problem with the imitation, and from this point of view, psychologically, in order to understand part of the mentality of these new governments that are coming in the last years, it's not only Poland, as I told you, Think very much in terms of the second generation of migrants. The first generation is coming, trying to do everything to be integrated in the community in which they came, trying to do everything in the host country in the way to please uh, the people who are there. And then comes the second generation. In a certain way, this second generation was born there. It's not interested to go back. By the way, there is no communist nostalgia in Central and Eastern Europe. It's not there at all. Not in the way, basically, that they went back the old political regime. Uh, but uh, at the same time, they start to feel this imitation as a humiliation. They start to go back to tradition. Michael Walzer what, wrote a very interesting book about the failure of the national secular liberation regimes. And he was making the comparison between Israel, India, and Algeria, trying to see why basically the religious movements come back. And his major argument was that exactly this. You have the first generation, which was a heroic generation. Their legitimacy was very much based on what they managed to achieve. But then for the next generation, basically, imitation, the fact that uh, nevertheless that you're 
borrowing voluntary starts to be perceived as, uh, as a problem. Many of these people go back to the tradition. Many of these people start to use their tradition in order to distinguish themselves uh, from, uh, from the place it is. And this is very much basically the language which you can see in Central and Eastern Europe very much with respect to Brussels, with respect to this or that. It's very much, it's our tradition. We're different. Uh, Polish uh, foreign minister basically make it very clear that for him, Europe is a society basically consisting of vegetarians and uh, cyclists uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, who basically believe in green energy and Poles are not like this. Uh, they believe in God, they believe in community. So from this point of view, for me, imitation is not related to imposure at all. And by the way, the very idea of normality, I was very much, for me, this was always a very important story. Because normality has two different meanings. One is normative, basically. Norm as an ideal, but norm is also what is the most spread in your society. For example, in many of our society, to behave normally means to give bribes because most of the people are giving bribes. So not giving bribes is not normal. On the other side, basically perceived from the point of view of the ideal, giving bribes is not normal. So people are slightly confused now what is normal and what is not normal, and this clashes of normalities is quite important. Even on the level of the geopolitical identity, after the end of, the Cold, of World War II, you have four nations that basically claim being exceptional, and I'm talking much more the uh, Euro-Atlantic area, for different reasons. United States and Soviet Union, basically because they represented it, ideological projects for the future, different superpowers, Germany and Israel, because of the World War II. See how this idea of normality comes in these four places. United States basically reconfirmed its normality, claiming that our universalism is going to be other people's normality, basically that the American model goes universal. Russians, for the while, decided that they'll try to be normal, and after they decided that it does not work very much for them. Uh, when you see in the case of Germany, they became excessively normal to the extent that basically cannot understand any being exceptional of this. And in the case of Israel, the very idea of normalization of Israel as a state was perceived as a security threat. I'm saying this because I do believe this is a quite interesting, this, it was a very fundamental discourse for everybody who was living in Central and Eastern Europe. After the end of the Cold War, the word normal was the most misused word ever. Everything was normal. I want to have a normal salary. I want to go to a normal university. I want to live in a normal country. Now this idea of normality has been very much uh, contested and questioned. Thank you. I have myself on the floor. Please introduce yourself before asking a question. Uh, thank you, Stephen Stoltenberg, uh, oh, analyst in the State Department. Uh, I cover Poland and the Baltic states, so your comments on Poland were particularly interesting to me. Um, you've raised so many Fascinating issues, Ivan. I don't know where to start, but let me just pose a few ideas and see how you respond to them. First of all, the uh, revolutions of 1989 were essentially elitist driven. I think people tend to overestimate the degree to which they were, they were popular. Uh, sure, there we have those images of the crowds filling the squares. Uh, we have the images of solidarity as a mass movement. But in 1989, those revolutions were actually quite elitist. And the people who came into power, especially the ones who designed economic policy, were following a fairly extreme form of neoliberal free market uh, economic uh, ideology, which <clears throat> was even more elitist and had even fewer roots in, in society. So, so these economic programs were just sort of thrust on these populations. Um, now, you might say that the crisis of liberalism uh, is derived from the fact that these liberal revolutions um, were, were never really broad-based movements. So that's one problem. I'm really struck by your argument about imitation uh, and the way that morphs into humiliation. Uh, that certainly is the case in Poland. Um, the Kaczynski movement, if you will, um, is really very much uh, a product of this sense of uh, the betrayal of liberal elites vis-a-vis -a, -vis a political culture which is viewed as sacred. Uh, 
We're talking about martyrdom, victimhood, sacrifice. This was the political culture that was very strong in Poland even under communism. And liberal elites, I think, undervalued the importance of that for identity. And so in this rush to become normal, they tended to disregard this political culture as irrelevant for the project of modernization. That was a fatal mistake. But let me ask a question. Um, why now? You yourself mentioned that Poland in the last 10 years is a, a miracle, really. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs published a report before the government was voted out. Poland's 10 years in the EU, 200 pages packed with data on how Poland is the, either the number one or number two per, uh, performer in most regards. Social inequality actually declined during this period, the Gini coefficient. Um, I think something like two million people were actually lifted out of poverty. So it's very, there's a paradox here. Why at this particular moment is popul does populism resonate with uh, about 40% of the Polish electorate? given the fact that, um, that this liberal model was by all empirical measures quite successful. One other question uh, or issue to, I wanted to raise was <clears throat> that when you look at this populist um, movement, it's important also not only to look at the ide ideology that drives it, but also the, that, that in a way this is um, a question of social mobility. Everybody I talk to in Poland mentions that a generation coming into the workforce feels blocked socially. <laughs> that the rapid advancement of the 90s, for example, and there's plenty of stories of people who made really rapid advancement uh, in the 90s uh, in their co professional career. And that, so now you have a generation, a um, lot of people with advanced degrees because institutions of higher learning sprouted like mushrooms after the rain in Poland. And now these people find themselves without, without uh, gainful employment or they're working uh, according to these so-called junk contracts with no benefits. So I think the Kaczynski phenomenon speaks to a generation that feels socially blocked. And if you look at the policies of the government, what they really boil down to in many cases is a, a wholesale purge in the civil service, in public media, uh, throughout the state creating thousands and thousands of new positions for people who had previously felt socially blocked. So that's another phenomenon, I think, to look at. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, th th thank you very much, because it, uh, at least it's very relevant, uh, what you're telling uh, uh, for, for my analysis. First, the idea of the elite nature of 1989. Get out of Poland, the only place where there was a mass movement, 10 million people, being members of Solidarity in 1981. Uh, by the way, this was the only place where you didn't see a lot of people on the streets in 1989 and 1990. There was a very uh, interesting, uh, very much argued against book uh, by a Princeton historian, uh, uh, Kotkin, uh, called Uncivil Society. And he makes a very clear story. He said, basically, to a great extent, the end of communism was, communism was betrayed by the communist elites which wanted basically to migrate to the West. They wanted security for their kids. They wanted different like. And to a certain extent, it was there. And from this point of view, it's not by accident that if you go back to the opinion polls in 1990s, the highest support for privatization was among the voters of the ex-communist party. This tells you something about the left-right divide. Uh, uh, also, there was an interesting optical illusion. There was, uh, in biology, uh, they have this experiment. They're putting something between your eyes. And one eye is seeing something that moves, and the other, basically, on the other side, nothing is moving. When they are asking you what you are seeing, you are seeing only the things that move. For 25 years, we basically were seeing only the things that changed. But for many people, not much changed. Many people didn't leave their apartment. People were totally invisible for us. And some of these parties make them visible. Uh, this was a totally different identity. See, if you are going to see what uh, is going to define most strongly to predict who is going to vote for Kaczynski party in Poland, it's not going to be age. By the way, more than 
uh, of the younger people voted on Kaczynski or on the far right of Kaczynski. It's not education and it is not incomes. The criteria which strongly predicts for whom you're going to vote was belief or disbelief that uh, accident in Smolensk where uh, President Kaczynski died was an assassination or was an accident. At least on the basis of what we know as a material coming from different governments, it was an accident. Uh, but of course, you also cannot blame uh, Poles that it's very difficult for them to believe that an accident with their presidents happened in Russia next to Katyn. Basically, history here plays totally different uh, intuition. But this is giving an idea that the classical conspiracy theory gives identity, which before was given by ideologies, by religions. This was the major divide. This is basically a question on which you can very easily distinguish between those who support basically peace and those who basically go with Tusk and uh, uh, the other now opposition parties. And here I like, want to make a last comment. We also never studied very much the political impact of the opening of the borders and the fact that many people left our countries. In Bulgaria, we have a beautiful joke. Uh, three persons dressed like samurais walk on the streets of Sofia. So a bystander comes to them and said, who are you? And they said, we are the seven samurais. But why are you only three? The other four are working abroad. Uh, uh, I'm saying this because it's particularly true, by the way, for some of the small Balkan countries, for some of the Baltic countries. You do not have a critical mass of people to produce a social change. In a certain way, the major social lift, social promotion, was not to cross the class border, but to cross the state border. And the state border was easier to cross. So you have a lot of people who left the country. As a result of it, the demographic profile, but also the ambition of the societies has changed a lot. Uh, and I do believe that while we basically have been working with some of the classical hypotheses and some of the classical uh, models of democracy that was very much based on a society which was quite closed, also because of the Cold War kind of a frame, uh, there was this new mobility and immobility, very mobility for some and totally mobility for others, who change also the very nation of political community who belongs. Just to give you one example, 10 years ago, if you want to become a president of some of the Central and East European countries, better speak English or any other foreign language. This was perceived, this was normal. Now people very much tend to vote for politicians, political leaders who do not speak foreign languages. Because the idea is those who speak foreign languages, they always have an exit option. Mr. Barroso, who personally uh, I uh, like, but when you are not in Brussels, you go to Merrill Lynch or any of the big banks. If you don't speak foreign languages, you cannot end up in an investment bank. So as a result of it, the, there was a very strong nationalization movement. But unlike in the 1930s, where the idea was to nationalize assets, now you try to nationalize the elites. You basically try to insist that they're going to be with you till the end. And by the way, this is not ungrounded fear. Look what happened to the Greek elites, where a huge part of the most cosmopolitan part of the Greek business and political community left the country with, one, with around one third of their GDP when the crisis started. The idea that we're going to be in the same boat is not taking for sure, because now the kids of these elites does not go to the same school, they go to the private school, they don't go to the same hospitals, they go to private hospitals. The only institutions where people and elite meet are prisons. Uh, and as a result of it, you should not be surprised why people so much insist to have their ministers in prison, even not asking who of the minister basically should be there. Thank you. Uh, John, then Jack. Hi, John Glenn from the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. Yvonne, it's great to have you here. Thanks for the joke, too. I always count on one from you. I guess I'd like to ask you to look forward toward what at some level must be understood as a breakdown of institutions. If the nation state, will some of the nation states will cease to exist, if liberal democracy will cease to exist. I mean, if you look on the former side, you mentioned the UK as a great example. If we see a hard Brexit, which is what I read, I mean, I would summarize it that they have impoverished their elderly and beggared their youth. 
And it would si be a sign of sort of that this is not simply an opportunity for nostalgia. If we see this sense of uh, liberal democracy breaking down, I mean, this is a region that has seen the consequences of that again and again, and it often involves violence. How does one make this case looking ahead about a breakdown that in, in, some, ball, ver, in some version involves a breakdown or reconfiguring of institutions that it hasn't turned out well? Listen, the trend which I see, and which was, by the way, spelled uh, very strongly by Hungarian Prime Minister in the July 2013, when he talked about the liberal democracy and everybody was very much focusing on the term, his major argument was the following. He said, in a globalized world, where the only source of global kind of growth is the global market, but the only source of legitimacy is domestic nationalism, you need, you need a strongly majoritarian regimes which are basically going to have their legitimacy on the fact they, they spoke on behalf of the majority, but not on behalf of the, some of the minorities there, political or otherwise. Uh, and this kind of a strong majoritarian regimes, they're not going to be liberal in the classical sense. It's not that they're basically, elections are always going to be there. This is the other difference. Uh, elections are remaining the only source of legitimate power. But these elections are going to elect governments and political leaders who are not going to be interested to be constrained either domestically by independent institutions or from outside. European Union. And now European Union from this point of view is facing a huge problem. Normally you can expect that European Union is going to sanction and put pressure on some of these regimes. This was the idea that liberal democracy is going to be safeguarded uh, because European Union is going to punish uh, some of these regimes, and in the case of Central and Eastern Europe, it's not the case of United Kingdom, the European Union, of course, has the resources. Paradoxically, all these regimes have two sources, two pillars of their uh, existence. One is European money, the second is anti-European rhetoric. They cannot survive without none of them. Anti-European rhetoric is not enough because the economic situation is going to decline. On the other side, basically, they need anti-European rhetoric, basically, to try to uh, go to their voters. Uh, but the story is, I expect these majoritarian regimes, they're going to be much more harsh. They're going also to very much talk totally different about their neighbors. Some of them are going to be, and Turkey is a great example of this. Listen, Turkey has a competitive politics. From this point of view, this is not Russia. You have elections. But you don't want to be opposition in Turkey. And you don't want to be a journalist uh, in this type of regimes because basically, according to these leaders, going against them is going against the nation because they do not simply claim to represent a numerical majority. They claim to represent the true Poles or the true Bulgarians or the true Turks and all others are traitors. And this kind of a true against the traitors is becoming one of the things that unfortunately I do believe is going to very much develop. They're going to be a very strong anti-cosmopolitan sentiment if this uh, uh, basically trend continues. So from this point of view, people always like to go back to the 1930s in Russia and so on. And so, I mean, Soviet Union, no, it's much more 1950s. Uh, basically where you have the Soviet soldiers who won the war coming back much more self-confident than others. And then the division is, we against the foreigners. I mean, Jews as a metaphor and not simply basically as uh, the concrete uh, community. So I do believe this cannot be excluded at all. At the same time, we talk about the small nations. We also talk about Europe in which a lot of country, a lot of people are living not in their countries. Uh, these people are also a political force. They have houses, they have friends. Uh, but this is a new divide. Uh, and from this new divide, which is not classical left-right anymore, but it's much more nationalist, internationalist versus nativist, one of the things that is really disappearing is which was the Marxist internationalist-minded working class. Because if they're not going to be a global communist revolution, and if communism is not going to run around the world, there is no reason for the workers to be internationalists. Uh, so this is why it's not a kind of a, a surprise that we see this major migration of some of the blue color voters, which also one of the basic losers of uh, globalization in many of the countries, uh, to the cultural nativist parties. Let me add one uh, small question to that, which is 
I read something, I think, in one of the articles that are in the uh, forthcoming uh, issue that the left parties, the newer ones like Podemos and so on, have remained resolutely pro-immigrant, I guess one could say, opposed to uh, any restrictions on migration, which that's because they, their voters are not workers, but... Uh, yeah. Podemos is, <laughs> from this point of view, a leftist, but not a workers' party. Workers are still much more as the socialists and major trade unions and others. I do believe you have this interesting phenomenon because in the South, uh, this type of a much more radical anti-establishment vote goes on the left because of the financial crisis. It's a sovereignist. It's very much a class war, but it's not uh, the old left. And from this point of view, uh, Mr. Iglesias, the leader of Podemos, makes it very clear. Uh, basically, they're using a or Ernesto Laclo, one of the famous uh, political theories which the new left now is implementing, uh, very much believes that populism is critical for any type of what he's going to say progressive politics. The problem is how rightly to define the people. And the people there are defined against the caste, against the political elite, and then these groups are, Syriza is also true. Syriza is also much more friendly uh, to the refugees and others but they're quite unfriendly to the business community. So from this point of view, you, you decide, in both cases, we talk about understanding of politics, which is in a Schmittian friend uh, uh, enemy distinction. The only problem is that you decide who is the enemy. Uh, on the South, it's much more basically the political and economic class. In the Eastern Europe, it's much more the ethnically others, basically the refugees, the migrants, the others. But the nature of the political conflict is not different. So from this point of view, you have the return of the Schmittian politics much more than simply basically, but in two different versions. Uh, Jack. Thank you, Ivan. I want to pick up something you said about the nationalization of elites. But I'm going to point the finger more at us. What I've seen all over the world, whether it's Russia, Hong Kong, China, Turkey, Europe, the United States, is that the liberal democratic elite, people like us, have somehow completely lost touch with the ordinary people in their own societies. They talk about losers, people without education, that if we could give them a better picture of the world. That's not true. What I see when I go around is that there are people of all income levels, all levels of success, but who are rooted in their community and they feel that their community and their society is under attack. They may feel their religion is under attack, the integrity of their nation is under attack. It may be from globalization, maybe from immigration, it may be from international trade, but they just feel that their leadership has no idea of the fear and the anxiety that they feel about preserving the character of their community and society. And so they'll turn to leaders who say, I feel your fear, I'm going to defend our society against any threat. And that's preferable to leaders that still natter on about democracy and liberalism and free trade. So my question is, is there any going back to fix this? I mean, in Egypt, when we had an opportunity for democracy, the liberal elite was so completely out of touch that they were ignored and tossed out. We're in danger of seeing that here. We're in danger of seeing elites identified with Brussels treated as traitors. In Turkey, as you mentioned, journalists and intellectuals who have any trafficking with the West are seen as traitors. How can we recover a sense that we as liberal, pro-democratic elites can in some way speak to the people who we want to reach? Listen, you're absolutely right, and I do believe that uh, in many respects people had the right instinct, even when they vote for some very crazy people, uh, because paradoxically for them, the idea of accountability and democracy does not make sense if the borders of the political communities are unclear, if you don't know basically who is responsive to you. So from this point of view, I do believe it's very important. On the other side, it's very important how you're going to define political community. Because if you go and define political community in a totally exclusive terms, then basically you're going for a conflict and to be honest in this world in a big one. Uh, one uh, very kind of a radical European politician came to Bulgaria and said, listen, uh, it's time to say to people the truth, stop with political correctness, name Islam as uh, a major threat, name Turkey as a threat, tell them that they're never going to be the EU. 
was a very interesting conversation. The only problem is that we have 10% of the Turkish population in Bulgaria and quite big border with Turkey. So probably this makes sense to have this type of a discussions in Vienna. Uh, and the public can uh, enjoy participating, uh, but it does not work well in Bulgaria. And here's the difference. People talk a lot about fear, that pe people are fearful and so on and so on. I have been uh, reading something about the Russian high security prisons where you have these really mature criminals. These are very polite people when they're between each other. They never swear. Because if you swear, another criminal authority is going to kill you. So from this point of view, these are people who know that words has consequences. It's not fear, it's anxiety. Anxiety is loud. People talk bullshit all the time. They shout all the time. A really fearful people are disciplined people because you really fear that what is going on can end up badly for you. And I do believe from this point of view, this is a moment in which we go through this anxiety, and to be honest, uh, all these type of populist parties and others, they share sa very same sentiment, but they're not a natural allies. Just give you a data from very recently. This is what you have not managed to read yet. Uh, Gallup International just finished a big global survey in 45 countries how the world is going to vote if they're voting on the American elections. It works well for Hillary. Out of 45 countries, She's winning in 43. The only two places where Trump is winning is Russia and Palestine. <laughs> Fine, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I don't want to go on this, you can, uh, you can. But the interesting story is the following. Why people who vote so easily for Trump-like candidates in their own countries are so negative on Mr. Trump? Why basically Austrians, who are on the edge to elect basically a far-right president, while the Dutch, who are basically ready to go for Wilders, is it not the same anti-globalization agenda against free trade? And so what's so bad about Trump? And here's the story. I was trying, and for me, there was two explanations. Once, of course, I'm going to call it the pilot hypothesis. I know many people who are ready to drink and after that to drive. But if they understand that the pilot in the plane in which they are is going to drive to drink, they go to ballistic. So the idea is that America is too big, basically, <laughs> to be allowed to do things that other countries are allowing themselves to do. This I understand. Uh, the second thing is much more important. Basically, one of the major arguments of the American type of anti-globalization populism is that America is the biggest loser of globalization, believes me nobody else is going to buy it. <laughs> not that this is not true for certain groups here, but most of the people and populist parties hate globalization because it's too much in American favor. So when Mr. Trump's come and said, listen, we're the biggest losers, you're losing the audience. Because it's even possible to have the cake and to eat it. What is not possible is to have the cake, to eat it, and also to ask others to be sorry for you. <laughs> Uh, uh, so from this point of view, I do believe uh, that we have this type of a situation which is very much explaining uh, this phenomenon. This is why how we're going to define political community. This is going to be really based on citizenship, contribution to society, giving chance to others to be part of you. To what extent basically, it's, I believe, for example, the border should be protected. This idea that we're simply going to open the borders and, no, and we're not interested who is coming, who is going. This is not how liberalism works. Uh, by the way, Jowett, who had a beautiful metaphors, distinguishes between three types of borders. One, he said, is a frontiers. It's like a singles bar. You go, you have a sex, you even don't remember the name, not identity being built. And the open border world works like this. The second is barricades. He said, this is like a Catholic marriage, no divorce possible. <laughs> A lot of identity, but from time to time, a painful one. Uh, and then basically, you have uh, marriage with divorce, which means that you have an identity. It could be renegotiated and so on. I do believe we are renegotiating borders, but much more the meaning of borders than the places of borders. The beginning of 20th century, it was very much, we, at least in Europe, we have been renegotiating the places of borders, where the border is. Now we are renegotiating the meaning of borders. And this is a painful negotiation because it's about identity. It's not simply about economy. It's not about voting. And it's not about institutions only. Mike Allen and Mark Schleifer. <laughs>
Along with the net, um, thanks for your comments, Evan. Uh, insightful as ever. Um, they reminded me of a conference I helped organise in um, about 1990, early 91, in uh, Bratislava. It was an international labour conference, and we brought together labour unionists and civil society activists from across the region, and a group of speakers, mostly from Western Europe, talking about the relationship between political systems and labour relations in Germany, and so on and so forth. It was a very interesting conference, but one night I remember I was sitting in the bar and I was talking to the interpreter, and all these guys were sitting around, they were mostly guys, very few women. I was saying, so uh, how's, how, what are you talking about? Is the uh, discussion had an impact? And she said, well, that guy there says he's going to emigrate to Sweden, that guy there says he's going to emigrate to Germany, that guy. And it struck me at the time that um, this kind of lack of ownership, as it were, of, of the kind of transformation process, which at the time I attributed to the Soviet legacy, the communist legacy, that it's not just collective organization or socialism that had been discredited, but any notion of social or personal responsibility. And I mean, you mentioned one political classic, but if you think back to Reinhard Bendix, nation building and citizenship, if you don't have a citizenship, that are committed to the project of nation building, state building, democracy building, then you've got a very fragile political project. So firstly, I was surprised in a way that you haven't mentioned at all the, the legacy, the Soviet legacy, cultural, psychological, and so on. Um, and just secondly, a point as an aside, you mentioned the, uh, the widespread defection of blue collar votes from the, the left to the uh, far right, um, which really shouldn't be a surprise because if you might recall as late, I think as 1959, uh, Marty Lipset wrote an article on working class authoritarianism in which he made exactly your point that it's that working class voters are inclined to authoritarianism precisely because of their socioeconomic insecurity and it's only really the educative political impact of intermediary institutions like labor unions that through political education otherwise fracture that connection and clearly given the weakness the institutional weakness of organized labor in the region um, and in europe or all over now it's uh, a helpful explanation i think Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I very much agree. It's interesting about legacy because the communist legacy works in different ways. One is because of the fact that society didn't have any experience with collective action. This was why it was so easy to have some of the very painful economic reforms in the first uh, years. For example, when the same type of reforms have been offered to countries like Spain or Greece with quite strong trade union uh, and traditions, it didn't work like this. Uh, but what is also interesting, and this is one of the problems that Europe is starting to face, not so much Central and Eastern Europe. European Union project was also the way for West European countries to break with their colonial legacy. Uh, don't forget that basically this was also the decolonization model. Uh, by the way, De Gaulle was very much interested also in the European integration, believing that France on its own cannot keep the colonial empire, but probably Europe as a whole can do it. Britain, which was the only one that basically believed after the end of the World War II that it has capacity to keep the empire, didn't join the European project. But already in 60s and 70s, for the Europeans, dealing with Europe means that they lost interest to some of the former colonial world. What we are saying with the immigration crisis is the following. Colonial world is coming back, and not simply through a kind of a cultural study books. You have people. These people go back to the diasporas. Uh, this is the second before it was the colonizers of Algeria going back to France and so on, but now it's the colonized. Why I'm saying this? Because we have been very much focused to understand the world simply in the categories of the post-Cold War. For many of the countries in the Third World War, the Cold War was also the moment in which decolonization was put into the refrigerator. Uh, I was fascinated by a book written by Indian English historians called The Ruins of the Empire, claiming something that is probably obvious to you. It was never came to my mind before. Uh, but he showed that the really important 20th century's war, from the point of view of the national liberation leaders, was not the World War I and not the World War II, but the Japanese-Russian War of 1905, when for the first time a white imperial empire was defeated. Uh, and for people like Ataturk, for people basically like all these uh, Chinese nationalist leaders, this was the inspirational war. 
This was the war that basically you can understand that uh, uh, European empires could be defeated. I do believe that something like this is happening. Uh, as a result of it, we basically try to uh, reduce the post-Cold War world totally to the legacy of the Cold War. And then you start to come with countries which react in a different way. You remember Bob Kagan, whom I very much like and respect, who basically said, listen, the major predicator for the foreign policy choices of a nation is going to be the type of a political regimes. Democracies are going to side with democracies, authoritarianism is authoritarian. We don't see this much. Brazil being a democracy, India being a democracy, on major issue, they didn't cite the way basically this theory predicts, because it appears that for them this type of post-colonial identity is much more stronger than their identity as a democratic regime. So from this point of view, I do believe how to figure to where the Cold War legacy matters, how the Cold War legacy matters in different parts of the world is something also that, in my view, is quite important. Of course, in Central and Eastern Europe, from this point of view, we're in a unique position because for us, the world was Europe. We never had been imperial nation. We didn't manage basically to create the colonies. Not that we didn't want, we came late. Uh, uh, but as a result, of course, this put us in a totally different position also when trying to understand uh, how the world is functioning today. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Ivan. Mark Schleifer from SIPE, the Center for National Private Enterprise. Um, I'd actually like to expand on your your last comment about identity and sort of Europe, European identity and, and this notion of culture. Um, because when you were talking about Poland, you mentioned Euroscepticism. But I wonder whether you make a differentiation between skepticism about the EU and Euroscepticism. Um, and what would you make of the, the notion that, you know, while Central and Eastern Europe didn't participate in the colonial uh, project, the notion of European identity is very important to these national leaders. They see themselves very much as the buffer between European Christendom and the Muslim world. Uh, and how, how do you see those trends playing out? Uh, very much. Basically, this is true for Poles, it's true for Hungarians. In a certain way, all of them claim being the true Europe, the Europe that had been basically destroyed by the European Union. The Europe, which was very much based on Christianity, on traditions, on a kind of European conservatism. Uh, and uh, in a certain way, uh, true. Uh, if you see the language on which, for example, the Russian leaders are attacking the European uh, Union, particularly after the Ukrainian revolution, this is the same language on which the West was attacking Soviet Union. Uh, after uh, communist revolution, Bolshevik revolution of 1970s, the major attacks of the Russians was that the European Union does not believe in God anymore. Not the Russians believe much, but uh, at least this was the attack. And secondly, free love, uh, basically gay marriages and things like this and so on. So this cultural dimension for sure is there. By the way, demography and relations to gay marriage is also something that is totally understudied. You can see to such an extent some of the shrinking and aging populations are developing a much more hostile view. Uh, but here, the interesting story, I have been doing some polling concerning trying to see the uh, generational differences on certain issue. This is an interesting, I'm talking only about Europe. When you talk about Europe, there is a major difference between generations when it comes to things like gay rights and gay marriages. With the exception of Hungary, in all uh, 17 countries that we polled, the younger generation come with a plurality for. So for the younger people, it's a different world. And this does not go. When it comes to migration, there is no difference between generations. So this is a different type of otherness. Basically, ones that you can see there and here, and it's socially easily understandable. But I agree very much with you. First of all, European identity is not questioned by anybody in the European Union. The idea is how we understand European identity in the way it is formed by the idea of a common European space created by the EU. Here, by the way, I'm also going to make a distinction between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, what is the meaning of Euroscepticism. In a strange way, in Europe, you have much more what I'll call Europessimism. Uh, many in our countries believe, at the end of the day, with all its deficiencies, the European Union is better for us than what, is going to, what was before or what is going to come. But many of us are also more skeptical about the resilience of the European project because unlike West Europeans, we have the disintegration of the political system in our personal experience. I was talking to a lot of 
political leaders from the region, by the way, almost all of them coming from a very strong anti-communist background, but they're going to tell you the following. We have seen how something that was forever collapsed overnight. So when West Europeans are telling us, oh, European Union can never can disintegrate, is this and that, they don't buy it. Because we have the feeling that we have heard this before. And this type of experience for me is a very critical category for any type of a political analysis. Uh, we have been talking with Mark before I came. Nobody can understand certain type of democracy coming uh, from German exiles that come to United States after uh, Hitler came to power if you don't know when they came. For example, uh, Leo Strauss came very early on. He didn't have any living experience under the Nazi, so for him the problem of the Nazi was the problem of the collapse of the Weimar. So in a certain way he never managed to forgive Weimar Republic that they brought. Nazi to power because this is what his experience. He remembered, he saw how it worked. Han Aren came later. Her preoccupation was different. And from this point of view, experience, I'm talking about on the level of the political theories, but it's on the level of every individual. When crisis comes, you always go back and try to remember what happened in a similar situation. So from this point of view, the East and West sure. is also divided in the way a society is divided between people going to a financial crisis, between people who already has burned by a run on a bank, and people that were not. And from this point of view, European suspicion towards European Union is not so much a moral judgment. In the case of Kaczynski, it is. In the case of the ordinary post, it's not. Because don't forget that one of the most beneficial group from the European integration is the Polish peasant, the farmer. And by the way, one of the regions of the United Kingdom which strongly voted against were regions in which some of the most European money had been invested. So from this point of view, when people try to reduce every explanation to economic explanation, they should keep this in mind. I wanted to ask a bit more about your uh, about the polling that you've done on, on generational yeah. differences. Uh, I mean, I've been wondering whether part of the problems with democracy, not only in Eastern Europe but in other third wave democracies, is the fact that you now have substantial numbers of voters, probably majorities in many countries, who did not live under the previous regime, who have no experience of what it's like to live elsewhere other than in a democracy, and which makes them feel less of an uh, attachment and need to support it. But anyway, is, does that sound plausible to you? And also, what, what is the polling show on these guys? No, no, it's very true. But also don't forget, there is no new generation which is going basically to live with the identity of the previous generations. Always the new generations basically go into a different type of conflict and they're basically making their own identity based on this conflict. So from this point of view, surprisingly, for the younger generation, the communist anti-communism axis is not the one that basically shapes their identities. Uh, and from this point of view, theoretically, we try to insist and try to basically view them through this prism, but this was basically the choices and the axis on which their parents acted. For them, there are other things. By the way, for them to stay in the country or leave the country is one of very major choice. Some of this younger generation are much more nationalistic, and I'm not putting this in a negative sense necessarily, because nationalism could be also a very important uh, uh, factor for consolidating democracy. And we know it very well. The Baltic states, by the way, are one of the greatest examples of this in the post-communist period. Uh, but they're asking uh, this type of questions, because this is a generation also which is culturally and technologically very different. For example, in my generation, speaking a foreign language, particularly Western language, was a major exception. We have been monolingual in a way. Some Russian, for sure, but Bulgarians, we always get the feeling that when we speak broken Bulgarian, we speak Russian. So from this point of view, it's never sure how well basically it is. Uh, now you have a generation which basically is speaking, for example, English out of everywhere, it's films, it's music, and so on. So culturally, it's a totally different generation. 
Technologically, they get the information in a totally different way. The way they react to certain issues is very different. And from this point of view, I do believe there was this assumption that the younger people are always going to be more liberal than others. By the way, I see this for the first time in former Yugoslavia, where you can see the last you know, T2 generation being the much more liberal than the next younger generation because they have been traveling much more, they have been asking questions about who we are and so on. I also do believe that, for example, some of the new generation in Russia, people in their 25, 30, the Putin generation, is more conservative and authoritarian than Putin himself. Uh, they have a less of experience, basically, of a broader world. So I do believe that generations should be always connected to the idea of what is the shaping experience. It's easier with the war generations, where basically you know which is the collective experience that do it. For us, uh, for my generation, of course, 1989 was the shaping experience. But for this younger generation, they're totally different things. They're not living in our type of choices and oppositions. And this is why they also, from time to time, look at us as irrelevant. I mean, not only uh, because of our kind of uh, out of place uh, feeling, but also out of time, basically. Do you know that now in university in Bulgaria or Czech Republic or Poland, if you're going to try to tell some of the old, very funny communist jokes, believing that you're going to attract the attention of the public, you're wrong. They don't understand what we're talking about. There is, because everything is based on a type of experience that is not there anymore. So it's, uh, just to give you one joke like this, you know, and this, by the way, not a joke, this is a classical case on the Soviet, on Russian television, there was a, uh, interviews with 20, 12-year-old uh, uh, schoolboys asking them, do you know who Chapayev is? And Chapayev is one of the famous heroes of uh, the Civil War and the Communist Revolution. At some point, people were saying, most of them don't know, some saying something. And one guy said, he's an Indian tribal leader. <laughs> Why do you believe this? Asked the journalist. And he said, because I have read somewhere that uh, he has been fighting the whites. <laughs> 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 so, Nadja, do you have anything to say on the subject of generations? Uh, yeah, I know you've written uh, yeah, a book. several books on it. Only one. Um, yeah, um, actually, I, I, I did have a sort of um, bubbling question about Ukraine, but just. Um, on, on generations, uh, I mean, as you know, since I did d devote some, some attention to this, the, the, the startling thing that I did discover in my own research was that the sort of assumption that many of us in the sort of democracy community, the sort of liberal democratic community have, that the younger generation is automatically going to be more liberal, more democratic, so we can kind of um, you know, send them off on their way without paying too much attention to them. Uh, is is usually not not right. They that they're, they're more dem, they're more radical, more energetic. But uh, as we saw in Russia, that radicalism and energy can actually be harnessed by a government and that will funnel them into organisations like Nashi, where this sort of uh, uh, creating this identity. Um, I think you're, you're talking about something different for Eastern Central Europe, but yeah. in Russia that never has been a a nation state. Um, you know, when you talk about nationalism in Russia, you don't have a nation yet, really. So that's a sort of on the side. But uh, my, my, my sort of bubbling question about Ukraine, um, I always have bubbling questions about Ukraine, um, was that um, the European idea in Ukraine actually brought people out onto the streets. Um, uh, it uh, people died on the streets for this idea of, of, of Europe. Uh, and maybe you could comment, I think I, I, I know the answer to this, but I would like to draw you out and how you see the sort of juxtaposition between what, what's going on in Ukraine, Russia, to what's going on in Europe, uh, Central Europe, that is really just right next door to each other. And can they have an effect on each other? Um, and so on. You know what? Uh, my idea is, and this is basically something that preoccupies me quite a lot, I do believe that in order to understand this very much changing picture, we should try to change the perspective. We have been trying to explain everything that was happening in Europe for the last 25 years through the key of the expansion of the European Union, the change of the European Union, and this is valid to some extent. Uh, but my idea is, let's go back 100 years ago, exactly 100 years ago, and see how the three 
continental empires started to collapse at the end of the World War I. I mean the Russian, the Ottoman, and the Habsburg. As a result of it, you have three post-imperial places, uh, spaces that had a very different history with respect to their political identities. Central European Habsburg space, first you have the collapse of the empire, then the nation state appears, then basically the communist uh, period came and so on. But there, of course, you have the European Union, but this clash between the national and post-national is very much present there. In Poland, in Hungary, who are we? Is it possible to be a cosmopolitan and being a good Pole at the same time? Historically, it was not an easy question, always. In Russia, the process of decolonization was stopped uh, by uh, uh, the consolidation of the Soviet Union. And honestly speaking, what I see in the post-Soviet space is not very different than you have been seen in other parts of the world when the colonial empire started to collapse. You have an emergence of a new national liberation movement. Some of them basically, in the case of Ukraine, having very much uh, uh, under the European flag, but it's a nation building in a classical sense. And of course, Europe and the identity of European Union is very important for this nation building, exactly because uh, we're talking about con continental empire you are not talking about. Post-Ottoman space is much more interesting uh, because Turkey decided to go as a nation state after the Turk. Uh, you have, after the World War II, the emergence of these post-colonial states like Syria, Iraq, and others. And what is in crisis there is not the colonial empire, but the post-colonial state. And this is why religion is much more giving identity to the people, and the classical pan-Arabic nationalism that was so strong in the 1960s has disappeared. Why I'm saying all this? Because in a strange way, Ukraine is going to face the following problem in its relations with Europe. Everything that, many of the things that Ukrainians are doing, and they're going to call Europeanization, from the point of view of the Europeans, is going to look like a classical nationalism, and this was this obsession with uh, far right and so on. And this is not, this is basically, this is how, on the other side, many things that Europeans are doing uh, are going to look to the Ukrainians absolutely strange and basically going to remind much more to the Soviets than anything that they imagined to Europe. Uh, part of uh, the mystery, and I do believe uh, the multi ultimate attraction of the European Union was that it managed for a long time to be a different things to different people. Very different nations imagining Europe in a different way. I do believe the only chance for the European Union to be preserved is to keep it. So from this point of view, I was in Ukraine recently, and it's very interesting because for Ukrainians, Europe is the way to answer a very simple question which comes from different sides. Are you not Russians? And they said, no, we're not. Of course, as a result of it, they can go very radical because uh, it's very popular now to say that Russia and Ukraine are different civilizations. I don't know what this exactly means, to be honest. I always knew that Bulgaria and Macedonians were two very different civilizations, nevertheless, that nobody knew about us. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but from this point of view, this type of a dynamics, which are going to be much more localized, is going to be very interesting. By the way, the position of the Polish government with uh, the new Polish government with respect to Ukraine is very interesting from this point of view. In the West, people normally assume that if somebody is anti-Russian, he's necessarily pro-Ukrainian. It's not always the case. Uh, and from this point of view, history is going to come back, but it's not going to be simply the history that we have been studying, I mean, for the last 25, 30 years. There's going to be a history in which different political parties, different political leaders are going to pick up certain pieces of history exactly to build on identities on the base of which they can claim legitimacy in the new world. Uh, and of course, nostalgia is going to be extremely strong political project. I was listening very careful uh, uh, to Mr. Trump. He's not saying, I want to make America great. I want to make America great again. And this, again, is present in most of the